I built a forging press. And it was really, really easy. It's, uh, it's been two months since I've posted, but that's not why. It, it only took a couple days. How about thing? And, um, I'd love to talk with you about how I'm going to turn it into this really cool 24-ton forging press. But I am drowning in clutter right now. Oh my god, I am like eight projects deep and every surface has got every tool pulled out. And I need to do something about it. Uh, yeah, never mind. Battery died. Clean the shop. Look, I have tools on my wall. And yeah, all the surfaces still have things on them. But they're at least mostly sorted and uh, there's floor space and... If I need clean table space, it's about a minute away. Hey, there's some over there. Look. That's an empty surface. Beautiful. This is a 24 ton log splitter. I got it for uh, 500 bucks. The reason it was so cheap, aside from being a few years old, was the gasoline motor didn't work. It's not supposed to do that. That's okay. I don't want to use the gasoline motor because I don't want to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm going to use this to build a press. To do that is really simple. I got to stick an electric motor on, I got to mount this on a table, probably lose the tongue and the wheels, and then I got to add some stuff in here. A top die and a bottom die. You think, you know, anvil, hammer, it's just the hammer moves very, very slowly and unstoppably. And I want to be able to swap them out with different shapes. So think a mount, you slide it into two slots, and there's a little lock, and on the end is a flat block of metal, or a rounded block of metal, or whatever. Same on top and bottom. And that's it? it seems too easy. This is a 5 horsepower electric motor that I got off the internet. And that ought to do the job. It turns out it's really simple to get this to attach to the pump that moves the hydraulic fluid that powers the hydraulic system. All I need is this. It's a simple coupler that keys onto this shaft via this, and then you turn the set screw, and that locks them together. There you go. A quick examination of the motor, of course, will show you that uh, there are no wires. When you buy a motor, sometimes you have to wire it. Maybe every time. I don't know. This is the first time I bought a brand new motor. Here's the specs of the motor, just for reference, if anyone needs to know. Also, that coupler just came off the end of the gasoline motor. Interesting. Cool. So on the inside, we have these two terminals. There we go. One, five, two, four. I'm sure there's a three in there somewhere. And the numbers on the label, then, should tell me what I'm connecting. A simple dryer replacement cord. So this is a 220 volt uh, single phase AC motor and that means what I'm wiring in here is two hots from a 220 volt line and the ground. Now I gotta make a socket so I can actually plug this in and step one, turn the power off. And then step two, think about it. And then double check. Wait for it. It turned this off, right? It's like really off. Uh, let me just double check. Uh, yeah. The extension cord is plugged in, and the light's not on, so it's off. It's super off, and I'm not about to die. It's, uh, I actually remember what was going through my head right there. I was thinking to myself, ah, should I make a joke with camera about, you know, making my last uh, will and testament right there, just in case, but couldn't quite put it together and decided it was a little too macabre. <laughs> I know this isn't the best wiring job here, by the way, for all you electricians out there, but I actually went back and uh, fixed it with the proper end caps for the wires and all that because, well, the first time I tried it, the uh, breaker just flipped and said, nope, something was shorting out. Did I get the wrong thing? This part's all very simple. Shouldn't be any more difficult than a Google and a trip to the Home Depot. Okay. Looks 
Reasonable. So you can see down in there, that's the piece that we have to interface with with this. What I'm gonna do is hold this up and measure where the plate needs to be, you know, what size, etc. Now instead of using a solid plate of steel here, I'm just using these two pieces of angle iron because that seemed uh, sufficient for this case. I might add a little reinforcement, but it seems very rigid. I'm mounting it such that there's enough space to give a little gap between the end of this coupler and the thing it interfaces with in case it needs it, but also I can adjust it down to be perfectly meshed as well. This motor isn't actually intended to be mounted vertically, as I'm about to do. I wasn't really sure if I could reorient the hydraulic pump. Uh, looking at other people's presses, it looks like you really can, so I may, in the future, cut the whole assembly off and rotate it 90 degrees so that it's uh, operating horizontally as it was intended to. I might not, though. Okay, we got it all hooked up. I've manually cycled it a whole bunch because when I took it all apart to fit it in my car, we had to drain at least a hose's worth, and I think I lost a little bit of other hydraulic fluid. Apparently, it's very important to keep the level within, uh, in this case, three to three and a half inches at the top of this tank. So let's check this again real quick. Make sure I don't destroy the hydraulic pump. <laughs> the length of that, what's it? Yeah, it's, it's at three and a half inches from the top. So it'll run, but I'm not gonna run it for very long. We're just gonna run it enough to test it and then I need to top off the fluid before I do any actual work with it. Probably not even the greatest idea to run it with at, at that level, but you know what? It's within technically at the bound, so it should be okay. He said, having never owned a hydraulic piece of equipment before. It's gonna be loud. So I'll probably just kill the sound. Here we go. Hey! It works! That's the first time I could be sure that this thing was actually going to work, and I was already $700 in. So now it's time to get this thing moved around and set up under this chainfall. Fortunately, this place used to be used as a mechanics shop, so there's a big three-ton chainfall up there just for lifting up engine blocks, I assume. Let's take that and lift it up and stick a table under it. But, uh, I don't have a table. I do have a whole bunch of scrap. Ta-da! Movie magic. go, just cut the nice heavy chain link, open it up a little bit. Gosh, I sure hope that's structural, because uh, we're about to put off a lot of weight on it. Very slowly, just to uh, see if any bad sounds happen, you know? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Why are you worried? Getting this lifted up is quite the effort. Probably okay, alright. 
I uh, highly suggest getting a helping hand. I was able to get it up there, but only just barely, even with the chainfall. Then just getting it carefully adjusted into place. Adding on a few extra segments here in the back to go around the hydraulic pump. And then off with the fenders, off with the tires, cut down on the footprint of this machine so I can get it maneuvered into place while still attached to that chainfall. Once it's off the chainfall, that's where it's gonna live. It's really heavy. <laughs> And who knows, maybe I'll use these tires for something else. Build a small tire hammer or something. That'd be fun. Now I was debating with myself about welding it on versus bolting it, and when it came right down to it, I just didn't have the time or materials to really do it right with bolting, so but I just welded it. So I've taken the big, the, the chain fall off, and left it fasten to the ceiling instead with another chain. With as top heavy as the machine is, I think it is actually a very good idea to have a safety line attaching it to the ceiling or to the wall or something. Anyway, on to cleaning off these little bits here. I think those are for holding the log in place and cleaning the surface so that I can get the, uh, the die stack built up. So these are all the pieces I need to build the structure of the dies. So the idea is these will be affixed along here on either side, just at the right height so that these can slide in like that. There'll be one on either side. This piece is the reinforcement for the end of the splitting wedge. Um, that's just gonna get welded right on there. That's the insulation on my ground clamp smoking. It's probably bad. And provide the backing support for the dies. Obviously the bottom already has a nice thick slab of steel. There. Just for the record, I can do a decent weld. So this is sort of mirrors that on the top. I recommend just buying a two inch thick plate if you can get one. I couldn't! Now I'm just quickly tacking everything in place while I have this uh, not attached. A lot easier to get to what's in front of me instead of above me. Okay, that'll come out. Now I gotta flip it over and bring the ram down onto it. Get it all nice and squared up and weld it into place. Just touch that on. It's time to put the, uh, the die holders on the bottom, nice and clamped in place, and making sure that they match the positioning of the top one. So a uh, cutoff disc doesn't quite get to the center of this round stock when cut from all sides. I really need a bad saw. That's 1045, one and three quarter inch round. Two pieces, this will be half of the compound die. It'll go like this. It's gonna go like that. The square piece here is chunks of the forklift tine, same one I used to make the anvil it's sitting on. The round has to be shaved down just so, so that the top of it is you know, uh, at the same height as the top of the square. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Last step is going to be to now weld these on, and the trick is going to be to make sure that the top and bottom are perfectly aligned. The trick with that is, um, 
there's nothing in this system that I can guarantee is perfectly square or straight or centered or aligned. So it's a lot better to do things in situ. Just cutting some shim stock out of a tin can here. The shims will hopefully help it not completely lock itself into place. And, uh, spoiler, they do, but getting the die out is difficult. In retrospect, I really should have just tacked it in place and then pulled it out, done all the welding. So, um, that's all of the exciting bits there. There's any different from anything else you should already know how to do if you're trying to do this yourself. I'm now going to weld the crap out of it. Now, done, 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 under pressure, and pressed as flat against the flat as it's gonna get. So. But when it all fails, uh, use a wedge. By just hammering this wedge in behind, it forced it out pretty well, and using spacers, I was able to get it out. Got it. Yay! Definitely uh, potato chip, just a little bit. And with that, top die, bottom die done, it's ready to go. I added a little lock-in for the top and bottom die so they can't just get spit out. This is just a simple drill hole and then a uh, piece of angle iron there. It's a very powerful tool. It's important to keep it moving and keep the metal hot, or otherwise it just sits there pushing hard against metal that doesn't want to move at all. And it's important to know when to stop using the press and go back to the anvil. But, you know, in a few minutes, I feel like I was able to knock out a blank out of a, a railroad spike here, even though I messed it up a little bit. And from here on out, the more dies I make for this thing, the more it can do. I want to get it set up so I can do drifting of, uh, you know, axe eyes and hammer eyes, as well as a few other things. Add a foot pedal to it and that sort of thing. But uh, that'll be a later video. So... Thank you all for watching so much. This was so much easier than I expected it to be. If uh, anybody has any questions, I'll try and answer them in the comments. You know, whatever. But uh, thanks for watching, and see you next time.